Hi everyone and welcome to Unit 7, Module 32, Memory Storage and Retrieval. These are your learning objectives and here is your vocab. So when we are talking about memory storage in this module, everything that we're talking about is really focused on our long-term memory. And that is unlimited. And important to note that memory does not reside in one particular place. Carl Lashley in 1950 did a study where he had rats learn mazes and then he removed various parts of the brain and had the rats retest on the maze and they were able to recall at least part of the maze route. So that shows us that not all of that memory was stored in one location. So memories also do not play like a recording. This is super important. We recreate a memory every time we recall it. So think of them as like little fragments more and we're trying to pull them together into the frontal lobe where our conscious thinking and our working memory is happening and recreate the memory. If there are pieces that we don't really recall, our frontal lobe uses our reasoning and judgment to fill in what those pieces are. And that's really more at a um, sub, it's not a conscious level that we're doing that. So when we are talking about this recall of memory, there are two different types that we referred to last module. That's explicit and implicit. Explicit refers to our effortful memory or our um, conscious declarative memory. And so again, we're talking about our conscious effortful thoughts. That's going to be our frontal lobe. And so you can see why the frontal lobe would play an important role in our explicit thought because it requires that working memory aspect where we have to consciously think about it. And the hippocampus, that is like our save button. So it doesn't keep the memories in the hippocampus because again, memory isn't stored in one location, but it's basically the part of the brain that says, hey, this part is important. Let's hit the save button on this explicit memory and save that. So when you hear the word amnesia, you want to think that that means there's some sort of damage to the brain that has resulted in memory loss. So there's also different types of memory loss, right? You can just be forgetting something. There can be some sort of interference, um, sleep issues, etc. But amnesia is specifically referring to damage in the brain. Implicit memory system, so again, that's our automatic memory. And the two parts of the brain that you need to know are the cerebellum and the basal ganglia. And the cerebellum plays a key role because, as you remember, it's part of that balance and coordination. So it's those automatic behaviors that we don't really consciously put effort into. And it also plays an important role in classical conditioning because of that. So without a cerebellum, or if yours was damaged, you would be unable to be classically conditioned. So if you think about classical conditioning and that it's that automatic learned behavior, so for example, um, a puff of air making your eye blink, right, and pairing that with a tone so that you just blink to the tone, that is an automatic, implicit, involuntary behavior that the cerebellum plays a key role in. The basal ganglia is also involved and specifically to procedural memory. And procedural memory would be something like riding a bike. So it's doing something that's kind of like a skill that you don't need to consciously think about. It receives input from the cortex, so whatever the frontal lobe might be sending it information, but it's not sending information back to, out to the cortex. Um, this part of the brain is also believed to be involved in any sort of like um, habit forming thing that we might do, like if we grind our teeth or um, like pick at our nails or something that we're not consciously doing. Infantile amnesia is the inability to recall explicit, so effortful memories from age zero to three, 
Obviously, we know that children learn how to walk and talk during the ages of zero to three, and those things are implicit or automatic. They don't require conscious effort to do them. So those are things that build and stay with the child, but explicit memories, such as like if you took them to Disney World when they're two, they're not going to remember them. Emotions and memory. So when we are very emotional, either like really excited, really fearful, etc., we have this whole reaction set off in our body, right? If you're really um, scared, you have that fight or flight reaction, and there is a hormonal reaction going on as well. And one of the things that happens is your body sends a lot of glucose to the brain because the brain is on high alert and it needs that extra energy to react. But it also uses that extra energy, that extra glucose, to heighten our ability to store the memories of that moment. So it actually heightens our memory ability. So this is what we call a flashbulb memory, which is a really clear, descriptive, and vivid memory of an emotionally charged moment or event. So for example, people during 9-11, um, they, even though it's decades later now, they can remember that moment in vivid detail. So when we're talking about retrieving information, how do we measure that? So there's two different types of retrieval, and that's recalling information, which would be like a fill in the blank or an FRQ. It's just ask a question and you have to come up with the answer without any sort of um, cue. Recognition is identifying items previously learned, like a multiple choice. So the answer is there in front of you. You just have to be able to identify it. Obviously, um, recognition is easier and we tend to recognize much more information than we can actually recall. Herman Ebbinghaus, again, did a learning experiment on relearning and he found that as our rehearsal of information increases, our relearning time decreases. So the time and minutes taken to relearn information and versus the number of repetition on the list, there is that um, negative correlation. So overlearning is also important here. So this is learning, it, this is additional rehearsal of the information. This also increases our retention, especially if it's distributed over time. So distributed practice can really help that. So it's like you've already learned this information, you think you know it, but kind of go back again, rehearse it more, and that's actually going to help you retain more of the information. At the synaptic level, when we look at this retention of information, there was a study on sea slugs and learning done by Kendall and Schwartz, and when they studied these sea slugs, they found an increase in the release of serotonin into certain synapses. And those synapses and those connections between neurons became more efficient. This is called long-term potentiation, the increase in a cell's firing potential. So basically, the more you relearn, the more you overlearn and rehearse and focus on that information, those neural networks, those connections that are actually physically changing in your brain, right? I always say like when you're learning, you're actually physically at the synaptic level, at the neural level, changing your brain. So it's creating these neural pathways that are becoming stronger. There are more synapses, there are more connections between neurons, and they're becoming more efficient in talking to each other. That is long-term potentiation. Retrieval cues are super helpful, and you want to have as many retrieval cues as possible when you really want to remember something. 
So a retrieval cue is when you encode information, you also encode various pieces of info surrounding it. For example, when you're reading something in a textbook, you might be able to recall like where you were when you were looking at that page, the picture on that page that might not even be relevant to what you're reading is just like a picture of a person looking sad. Um, you might remember um, what you were eating. Like there's all these little things, all these little tidbits. If someone told you a story, if the teacher told you a story related to it, you might remember the story. So the more retrieval cues you have, the easier it is to recall the information. Priming is a retrieval cue. So if you are asked to spell the word hair and you have just seen a rabbit or maybe you um, were talking about a movie um, where there was a, a rabbit as the character, somehow there was a rabbit involved. Even though you weren't consciously thinking about that, it might result in you spelling the word hair, H-A-R-E, instead of H-A-I-R. So it's activating particular associations on the unconscious level. All right, so these are diff these are three different ways that what we remember can be dependent or related to our mental state. So context dependent, this one comes up a bunch. This is when you recall more information if you are in the same location in which you learned it. So it's easier to um, learn to take your math test in the math room where you're learning that information. So an exam another example is like you're sitting on the couch, you're like, oh, I really need my glasses, they're in the kitchen. You get up from the couch, you go to the kitchen, you're like, why did I come in here again? And you go back to the couch, and as soon as you get back to the couch, you're like, oh yeah, I need my glasses. And you get up and you go. So being in that location tends to help you remember the information that you were trying to think about. State dependent. So this is about um, our state of being, our psycho psychological state of being. So we don't really learn much when drunk, for example, but if you learn something or experience something when you were drunk, it's um, you might have easier recall when you are drunk again. Mood congruent, this one comes up a lot too. State dependent doesn't come up as much, but mood congruent comes up also. And this one is basically, if you are in a good mood, it's going to be easier to recall memories that are congruent or go along with that good mood. So happy, positive memories. If you are in a bad mood, you are sad, um, you will recall more sad events. You will remember more sad things. Serial position effect. This is our tendency to remember um, the beginning and the end of a list. So if you look at this graph over here, that red line, see at the top, um, at the beginning here, they're remembering a lot, and there's a big drop off in the middle, and then it goes back up at the end. So that serial position effect that we remember the beginning and end of a list. If you're only referring to the beginning of a list, that's primacy effect. So think of the word primary or first, the beginning of a list. And recency effect is the tendency to recall the last items on the list or most recent for recency. So our takeaways, our implicit memory, you want to think the cerebellum and basal ganglia for parts of the brain. Explicit, remember that's effortful, so you remember frontal lobe and hippocampus for hitting that save button. Our memories do not reside in one place. Carl Lashley taught us that. Retrieval is easier with relearning, overlearning, and retrieval cues. Our mood, our location, our psychological state, those all have an impact on what we, what we remember and what we encode. And memory encoding is heightened when we are in an emotionally charged event. Our brain is getting extra glucose to remember extra information.
So that wraps up our module 32.